This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hi, all. Welcome back to Ask the Expert. I'm your host, Steph Soar. And today's guest is the fabulous author historian, Dr. Mickey Mayhew, here to discuss the subject of his new book, Imprisoning Mary, Queen of Scots, The Men Who Kept the Stuart Queen. Welcome, Mickey. Hello. Nice to be here. So Mary, Queen of Scots, was notoriously held in captivity with several different, quote, wards, I guess we can call them, before she was ultimately executed by her cousin, Elizabeth I. So before we get into the real meat of this conversation, can you give our listeners a quick synopsis of how her imprisonment even came to be? How did this even start? Well, Mary was originally imprisoned in Scotland by her half-brother when she had she married the Earl of Bothwell, and that went very badly. She managed to escape. She escaped to England, and from there she was promptly locked up by Elizabeth I, her cousin. And that was it until pretty much the day she died. So it was Elizabeth who kind of pulled the strings. At, well, so it was speak. more Cecil, who, her minister, who encouraged her to lock Mary up. But Elizabeth wasn't happy about having her in England. But initially, she did want her to come to court. But that was kind of knocked on the head really quickly. What do you think were some of the things that Cecil would have been uh, fighting for? Well, Mary was a Catholic, you see. And England was like pretty much a Protestant country by then. And they didn't want to repeat. I think they didn't want to repeat of Mary the First, Elizabeth's half-sister, and kind of, you know, mass burnings and stuff, even though Mary... Queen of Scots hadn't burned anyone in her entire life, but, you know. Now, once once she was imprisoned, yeah. at the time, you know, the Tower of London was, was some, some place that people would be kept and things like that, but Mary was not necessarily kept imprisoned in the Tower or in a jail kind of a thing. She was moved around from place to place in in people's homes. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, she wasn't, so, she, she wasn't a prisoner. She was a state guest, forward slash prisoner you know and she was a queen you can't really put a queen in the tower of london although you did put Anne Boleyn in the tower of london but you know what i mean sure mary hadn't been, so then sorry when mary came to england she hadn't been convicted of any crime she was on the run basically so she was on the run yeah. but wanted basically to elizabeth needed to basically know where she was keep an eye on her yeah mary her. wanted elizabeth to help send her back to scotland with an army to quell the rebellious Scots, but Elizabeth was never going to do that. That was never on the cards. So then how was one chosen to be a keeper of Mary, Queen of Scots? You had to have a lot of money, an awful lot of money, because Mary had to be kept as a queen in the style of a queen, and she had a massive retinue. So, And you also had to be very loyal to Elizabeth to be given that responsibility to make sure you weren't partial to Mary. You know, she had a good claim on the English throne, and Elizabeth was scared of you know, being knocked aside. So who was the first, uh, well, I don't, ward, I guess. What would you call the people that kept her? I keepers. I call them keepers. Okay, perfect. So who was the first keeper? Well, it was Sir Francis Knollys or Knowles. I never know how to pronounce it. So he kept her in Carlisle when she first arrived, along with Lord Scrope. And then when she was moved to Bolton Castle, which was Lord Scrope's, residence she still stayed with Sir Francis and then his wife died and he had he then handed Mary over to the Shrewsbury's. That's going to be an exciting one to go over because Bess of Hardwick happens to be one of my favorite (laughs) figures in this whole thing but we'll get to that in just a second. After this short break we'll return to our conversation between Steph and Dr. Mickey Mayhew on Mary Queen of Scots. What do we know about the day-to-day life of Mary while she was imprisoned? Because you had mentioned that that you have to treat her like a queen yeah. still, but you're still her keeper. So how does that even work? Well, she was shown a lot of deference. She could initially, when she first came to England, she was allowed to go out to attend church. She went on hunts. But then when word of this got back to Elizabeth, she started to panic about the security implications. So then they kind of kept Mary inside, but she could still pretty much do what she wants. She went to bed when she won. The ladies went to bed with her when they wanted to, you know, that sort of thing. So she did have her ladies with her. Oh, God, yeah. She had a massive retinue. She 
couple of hundred people when she first came. They didn't all arrive at the same time. They kind of followed her from Scotland. And initially it was just a small boat full of people who arrived with her. One of the one of the questions that came up a lot from our listeners actually was was what was it like? I mean, of course we want to talk about her Mary's experience, but what was it like for the keeper to have her? Because were they treating her as another child of their own family or or was obviously she's got to be treated like royalty, but did she have freedom as if she was just someone living in the house? Uh, no, it was dreadful. For the, It was worse for the keepers, I think, sometimes than for Mary. I mean, when she was with Shrewsbury and Bess, they literally sometimes would not let her out of their sight. They had to be with her, you know, almost all the time to make sure, I guess, that she wasn't plotting to try and escape or contact foreign powers. So, no, it was a massive millstone around the neck of these men and these women that they had to look after Mary. They hated it for the most part. What were they afraid of? I mean, we know that um, they were they didn't want her to go up against Elizabeth. Yeah. But where where would she have found followers then to take on Elizabeth if she's under the care of all these different people? Well, in the north of England, it was still then mainly Catholic and there was a massive sympathy for Mary up there. So she had plenty of people that she could, you know, contact and her ladies and her men. Would some they would be allowed out sometimes when she wasn't, and messages would be passed back and forth. And you know, yeah, she had a lot of support in that part of the country. So they quit. They they didn't leave it long before they moved her down to the Midlands, where she didn't have so much support. And that's when she came to be with Shrewsbury and Bess. There you go. That was actually my that was my next <laughs> question. Was how why would she be moved around? Was she moved around because of? her own actions or because of the keeper's actions or maybe a little bit of both? Well, security it kept people who were trying to free her on their toes if they didn't quite know where she was. And also with the Tudors, they kind of like, when they lived in one place too long, they had to do this thing which was they had to sweeten the place, so clean it out, get rid of all the crap and stuff so they would move on. So that's kind of like why they moved Mary around so much, for security and for hygiene. How long was she with each of her keepers? She was only with Sir Francis and Lord Scrope for about, I don't know, 18 months, give or take. She was with the Shrewsbury's for like, oh, about 14 or 15 years. And then Ralph Sadler and Paulette, just a couple of years each. And I remember reading about the Shrewsbury, um, and that would be Bess of Hardwick and her husband, that that there were all kinds of rumors going around between Elizabeth and Shrewsbury having some sort of sordid affair and all that. Have you ever heard of that? Or is that just kind of... Yeah, that's that's done the round so many times that has been. It's not true. It's not true at all. I think he may have got been fond of Mary at one point, but it never stopped him from doing his duty. And she never, if he loved her that much, he would have let her escape somehow accidentally let her escape, but he didn't. He almost bankrupted himself, making sure that she never did escape. But I suppose you could say maybe he was keeping her there because he loved her as well. So, But no, I don't think he did. I think that is just romantic fiction. So how long was she in captivity from one place, you know, from starting from when she was, when she escaped Scotland to the time that she was executed? About 19 years. And during that time, she was not necessarily involved with Elizabeth at all. No, they never met, despite what you see in the films and in the books. In the films, correct, <laughs> right. So why was that? I think Elizabeth didn't want to meet her. She didn't want to be charmed and won over. If she, When Mary wasn't really a real person to her, she didn't kind of have to deal with how she was treating her, I think. you know. And Mary was really popular and meant to be really sexy, and Elizabeth was always really insecure about being popular and sexy, so she didn't want to meet this rival queen. So that's basically it, I think. Do you think Elizabeth felt badly about having her imprisoned at all, or do you think she just didn't even think about her, out of sight, out of mind? I, I think she felt badly sometimes, but she was quite a hard person. She, she was a strong woman, forward slash a hard person. I don't know how you want to sort of take it yeah I mean Elizabeth you know thought she was going to die when she was imprisoned in the Tower of London so 
she thought Mary being kept in prison luxury wasn't much of a, you know, too much to deal with, really. She thought Mary moaned a little bit too much, I think. So as you're researching and writing for the book, was there anything that you came across that was interesting to you, you know, something noteworthy about her life living with these keepers or even something about the keepers that that you'd want to share with our listeners that that they might not know? I think the last keeper, Paulette, who apparently was meant to be really horrible and Mary hated him and he was a Puritan and he hated her, they actually had a really good relationship and she would ask to see him when she was at Fotheringay and waiting to be executed. She would ask him to come to her chambers and talk to him for hours and hours and they actually had quite a good relationship which hasn't really been uncovered before. So how did she get to the point of being executed if she was being watched and being kept all these years then what changed i think she finally realized she wasn't ever going to be freed so she, when people kept contacting her to say do you want me to get you out she said yes and her son james the sixth scotland had kind of disowned her and gone in with elizabeth so mary felt completely abandoned she had nothing to lose i think she knew elizabeth was never going to free her so she decided I might as well try and get out for real. And then Elizabeth got wind of it. It was a honey trap. Elizabeth possibly knew about the whole thing all along, though. Some people say she didn't, and it was all Cecil and Walsingham and stuff, but possibly Elizabeth knew that it was time to get rid of Mary and went along with it. So Cecil's name has come up a few times yeah. in this. What What do you think his role was then? How did he? How did he sway her? Who, Elizabeth? Yes, yep. Um, I think not long before Mary was executed, there were quite a few plots. There was the Throckmorton plot and the Parry plot, and Mary was kind of involved in all of these to one extent or another. And I think the danger just began to build. And Cecil said that we've got to do you, we've got to do something about this. She's becoming too dangerous. Plus, she was wrecking the Shrewsbury's marriage, albeit not directly, but they were breaking up because Bess was so jealous. So something had to be done. I'm going to put you on the spot here. This is a hot seat question. <laughs> but <laughs> are you on Mary's side or Elizabeth's side? I love them both. But I'm probably more on Mary's side because she's a bit more human. I think she's a bit more flawed and vulnerable. Whereas Elizabeth, I find, can be quite hard sometimes. I, at the risk of, of having, you know, all the tomatoes thrown at me, I think that I agree with that. Oh, good. I do. Yeah. So now the execution. Why would someone throw all the tomatoes at you for that? I know, okay. because Elizabeth, people love her. People love Elizabeth and, and you don't want to rock the boat with that one. But I do, I do think that, <laughs> that you're correct in that. Okay. We're supposed to think of Mary Queen of Scots as the bad guy and Elizabeth as the good guy, I think. Yeah. But sometimes I like to look at things a little bit differently. And I agree with you there. Okay. So so she goes on to, um, she makes a decision then, Elizabeth, to have her executed. Yeah. Um, and do you think this was a difficult decision for her? Or is this uh, something that she'd been kind of looking forward to all those years? Well, there was almost a point early on in the captivity when she tried to have Mary sent back to Scotland and executed, but that fell through. So because she didn't want to do it herself, so she wanted the Scots to do it. So when it came for Elizabeth to have to do it, she did agonise over it. And there's lots of anecdotes about did she sign the death warrant or pretend to sign it and or pretend she didn't know she'd signed it and all this sort of stuff. But, yeah, she didn't want to do it in the end. I think she would have happily kept Mary captive until she was an old woman if Cecil and the others hadn't said, look, enough is enough. Well, that's interesting. So then as as far as those points about the death warrant, did she sign it? Or did she know she signed it? I think she signed it and knew she'd signed it, but hoped they wouldn't ever use it. And they did. The minute they had it, they went over her head and just had Mary executed quickly. And apparently Elizabeth blew her top when she found out, but if she really knew they were going to use it, then she was acting. She was a great actress, Elizabeth. 
She was. She definitely was. And yeah, going going over Elizabeth's head is is a dangerous choice to make, I think, yeah, anyway. And it shows that she probably knew all along because all of the people who went over her head, none of them were really punished really badly apart from one guy who got sent to the Tower of London, but he, he lived, he still lived, and no one got their head cut off or anything. So, yeah, I think maybe Elizabeth no, knew all along. On kind of a uh, person, not a personal note, but kind of switching gears a little bit, of all the books that there are about Mary and about Elizabeth and their relationship, and like you said, there's even movies about them. Yeah. What made you write this book with this kind of skew, you know, towards the the people that kept her and, you know, what what drove you to want to find out more about this? Well, I always, I loved all the plotting and I thought it was the most interesting part of Mary's life. Plus living in England, I, I went to all of the places over and over again to research it. And I just thought it had never been told from the point of view of the keepers or the captors. I thought it was time to do that. And sometimes in some of the books about Mary, they do the cap the captivity in a couple of pages, you know. So I wanted to, like, have a whole book just covering that bit and not the Scottish bit. The Scottish bit's been done a lot. Well, I think you found a really interesting little niche here. I hope so. To, to have talked about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you have. So now, again, your book is called Imprisoning Mary, Queen of Scots, uh -huh. The Men Who Kept the Stuart Queen. That's right. Is there anything else that you that you want us to go out and look for? Oh, well, I did the little book of Mary, Queen of Scots, but that was quite a while ago now. That's just come out in paperback, third edition. But the book I'm writing currently is on Anne Boleyn, but I can't say too much more about it at the moment. Ooh, are you allowed to tell us when it comes out? It will be out in August next year. Perfect. And is that um, in the UK or can we find it here oh, in America too? Oh, yeah, it should too? be everywhere. Yeah, it should be. Great. Okay, well, we'll keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, the Mary Queen of Scots book, uh, where can we find that? It should be in all good bookshops and online from Pen and Sword, Amazon, everywhere else I can think of, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much again to our guest today, Dr. Mickey Mayhew, to our listeners who wrote in with questions. Of course, we could not do it without you guys. And to everyone listening to this week's episode. As always, we appreciate your support and hope you'll tune in again next time as we continue to ask our experts the pressing questions you want answered. And if you love the Tudor's Dynasty podcast and want to show even more support, please consider becoming a patron where you'll not only receive the great content we offer now, but extra insider research, info, prizes, and other exciting opportunities only offered by subscribing. Thank you, Dr. Mayhew. Thank you very much. And uh, we would love to have you back. I can't wait till your next book comes out. I'd love to and come again, back. Yes, please do. And again, to everybody, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.